Hi, my name is Mihail Malaymar Jr., the cinematographer for the Hate You Give, and you are listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today, I invite Mihai Malimara Jr., the cinematographer for The Hate You Give. Mihai and I discuss how he began working with Francis Ford Coppola, shooting for black and white, using Philips Hue lights in his filmmaking, and so much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, buy, rent, create at rule.com, Newshooter.com, essential news for real world shooters, Hedge for Mac, the fastest way to back up media, PremiumBeat.com, and Shutterstock.com. Well, we've got a great show for you guys today. Mihai Malimara Jr., the cinematographer from The Hate You Give. So we talk all about that film, but we also talk about his uh, his other work as well. His films with Francis Ford Coppola shooting for Black and White, which was a great and really interesting conversation that you guys are going to love. Um, we talk a lot about photography and uh, just things that inspire us. Oh, one cool thing is he used uh, Philips Hue lights. Yes, the same Philips Hue lights you probably have in your office right now or in your house right now. He used those as practicals in The Hate You Give. So we talk a lot about just LEDs and simple lighting that you can just, you know, buy on the shelves and throw into your films. And it, it's interesting to see that professional filmmaking at really high levels are using sometimes the same kind of lights you just may have in your home. It's, it's certainly inspiring, and we talk a lot about that. We also talk about him uh, shooting Panavision Millennium DXL uh, with those beautiful Panavision Primo 70 lenses. So lots of interesting topics coming up. Uh, but before we get there, um, I want to talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. Um, well, first of all, they have a giant inventory, so it's a no-brainer when you want to um, purchase and rent equipment. Um, I go there all the time because they have everything I need. But, you know, the thing that people don't think about a lot is when you're renting, it's because you don't own. You know, it's it's simple, obviously, but when you really think about it, if you don't own it, if you don't use it all the time, if it's not your primary piece of equipment, you may not know all the ins and outs about it. And what Rule also gives you, aside from a huge world-class, uh, world-class inventory of gear, is they give you peace of mind because they make sure before you walk out that door that you know everything you need to know about that piece of equipment. They support you. That's what they do. You know, they're going to make sure that you understand what it is that you're taking with you, which is huge because production's mission critical. Let's be honest. Not to be like overdramatic about it, but it kind of is. You know, you only have a certain amount of time to shoot. People are spending a lot of money. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people depending on you to do your job and do it well. And you don't want a piece of gear or not, not understanding a piece of gear to, to become a problem. And that's never going to be the case with Rule because they've got your back. So you get expert counsel in pre-production. You get technical guidance when you need it, when you take the equipment out on the field. Uh, these people are here for you from the beginning to the end. They're really partners with you. They are production partners. And that's why I love those guys. So you've got your gear. You've got your support. You've got peace of mind. It's everything you need. And it's right there at Rule Boston Camera. So learn more about them over at Rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. All right. Let's dive right in. We've got a lot to talk about with Mihai, and it's coming up right now. So I'm here with Mihai Malamari Jr. He is the cinematographer for the new film, The Hate You Give, and we are so happy to have you here, Mihai. Welcome to the Go Creative Show. Thanks for having me. I'm really psyched to to talk about the hate that you give uh, or the hate you give. Um, there's a lot of interesting cinematography techniques there, creating the two worlds. And I know you use some old vintage lenses on the film, but I have to start with your photography, uh, which I was just introduced to um, in some emails with me and your uh, and your agents. You have a, you have an Instagram specifically for your photography, and it is excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I guess it's uh, it, it's kind of how I started. And uh, uh, first of all, that's why I use Junior in my name. My father, Mihai Malaymar, he's an actor in Romania. Oh. And um, when I was 15, so it was fairly easy for me to decide what I want to do very early on. So I remember when I was 15, I went to my father and I told him I want to be a cinematographer. 
And um, he he's more of a theater actor, but he did a lot of uh, TV and uh, and film back in the day. And he was he was and he is very familiar with with the whole industry. So he told me like, okay, you better start taking stills and uh, read a bunch of books. And uh, so uh, when I was 15, I remember he enrolled me in like an after school um, still photography program. And very soon after I started building my my own darkroom out of like old uh, Russian equipment that part of it he owned and part of it I was able to to find. And um, then what was really interesting is that the Romanian film school uh, was so uh, was based so much on on still photography. We had for all four years we had like an intense still photography class. And what's interesting about it is that it's uh, it's for how you long? Think of, how long was for, the class? Uh, the, uh, no, I mean the whole program is four years. Okay. But uh, during all these four years, uh, we had a still photography class, and wow. it was. It was not only, uh, I, I mean, it was uh, a still photography class, but it was kind of evolving into all sorts of other things. For example, we were doing a, a photo photochemistry class, but we were learning about photochemistry, but in the same time we were using the dark rooms in the film school and experiment and learn how to, to read the density on a negative and and process uh, differently and, and do all sorts of chemi- chemis- photochemical uh, experiments. Yeah. So everything, and, and also our, our cinematography teachers, they had, I think because it was the cheapest way to learn, but uh, it, it goes to the core of... of uh, of everything when you're talking about movies and which is the frame and uh, what they were doing for example it was an interesting exercise they were giving us a, a, a phrase and we had to uh, to start from there and with 10 photos we had to tell that story and uh, wow we, that's no, a very no, cool exercise which which was great because it was uh, part of everything like you would uh, you would learn editing because we had to glue those photos together and you would see right away if cutting from one image to another would work or not what and, was an example uh, of a phrase i'm curious now i i, I almost no, want to like it, do this with our go creative show audience i love that idea uh, I, sometimes they were like the most craziest uh, things ever. They they were like random uh, proposition or phrases from from a book, for example. Okay. And they were trying to 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 make it harder and harder. Like how do you, uh, you know? It's like a lot of times it's uh, things that seem very easy to to read or write in the script. They are so hard to to show with an image. Yeah. And uh, they were yeah. they were getting. We we got some pretty tough ones, I remember. But the whole point was, uh, okay, how do you tell a story with uh, with images? And of course, it's it's a different thing when you're talking about a static image and a moving image. But I think it's 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 a really great exercise. And I think all all these things kind of developed uh, a crazy passion for still photography. And uh, I'm obsessed with 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 cameras now. I think I own a 35 oh <laughs> still God. photography cameras. And I mean, the reason is that we we were, uh, I, I think when I, when I entered the film school in Romania, it was right after the, the, the revolution. So I grew up in a, uh, in a communist country and, and until 16. So I remember my first, my first Steel photography camera was a Zenit. It was a Russian ripoff from a Nikon, and they were so poorly made. And we had so many. I craved for a Nikon all my life. <laughs> so, you know, and I, like, what what was interesting? What what it happened with all the the digital era? The the steel photography cameras became so cheap, and uh, it's like eBay and Craigslist kind of made me. <laughs> buy all these old steel photography cameras. And yeah. You know how it is? It's like stuff that you didn't have when you were a kid and you really wish you had them. Yes. Uh, but uh, now uh, what it's interesting about all this is that it's a really interesting, great way to to test things and uh, having such a variety of formats and, and old lenses and, and things like that. Uh, and that's what I, I love about steel photography because 
you saw I, I barely use any lights. I, I just go for available light street photography all and just it, it's a constant exercise that uh, pretty much uh, keeps you trained for for whatever project it's coming, but also it, it it creates a huge database. So when I'm starting a new project and I start talking with a director, I can show him. It's like, okay, this is how a, a 1950 Nikon lens looks. And this is how a, a modern Hasselblad lens looks. And it's like, it's so easy uh, because you can talk about visual style a lot, but I think it's so important to to show somebody an image and, and try to figure out if that's what they want or if that's appropriate for the project itself. And uh, it's I, I I love it. I think it's 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 one of my uh, it, it, it it's kind of I'm trying not to be a collector. I keep it as a hobby, and I'm the rule is that I have to use. If a camera doesn't get used for a month, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> I because then I have to sell it, and I don't want to sell it. So <laughs> it's one of those one of those things. And uh, when you have so many cameras, you tend to use the latest one the newest purchase for like a week or two but then it's funny like you get you get back to i i, I have a, a yeah, what's, what's the one that you keep going back to uh it's hard to, it's hard to, to to say i started with with nikons and uh um, for for a few years and i mean the whole the whole buying spree kind of started when I was working with, with Francis Coppola on Tetra. And the reason was um, we knew we wanted to, to shoot digital and we knew we want a really uh, luster black and white image for that project. And yeah. then I, at that time I had, I think, a Nikon D200 and I was like shooting a lot of black and white and uh, with that camera. But then I was like, okay, uh, I remember, like, how do I make... A digital image look like a like a Neil Ford black and white image, mm. and then I started buying and I bought an F5 and then I bought an F4 and I started shooting more film and try to figure out how to simulate that in, in Photoshop with images from the D200, and like uh, that was that was the the starting point for <laughs> buying a lot of cameras. Now, after a few years, I started. Because I wasn't interested in rangefinders for a long time, and I, I'm, it's funny. It's like you get that impression that if you're not uh, seeing exactly what you're gonna get, it's not uh, uh, as precise as mm. uh, some people think. But the rangefinders have an amazing, uh, uh, amazing quality and amazing beauty to it. And it's like only if you think about like all the. The, the 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 great still photographers were doing with Leicas and uh, like that should start you. So I started slow. I started with with cheaper rangefinders. But what a rangefinder does, because it doesn't have the mirror, the lens is so much closer to the to your negative that it's so much sharper and so much more interesting. And it's a nice training because in your in your optical viewfinder, you won't be able to see the depth of field like on, in, a, in a single lens, lens reflex yeah. camera. But it makes you think about it more, I think. And it's just like, it's, it's a nice exercise. So it must be almost keep, like, well, I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with using the range finders, obviously you are, yeah. you've been doing it. You, you I, I'm sure you sort of just know what, what it's going to look like, even though you're not necessarily seeing it, but that is yeah, a very no, different no. experience. I mean, filmmakers now, and really, I, I mean, I'm saying now, like it's just a current thing, but for a long time, since we've had digital cameras and, and viewfinders, you're used to seeing as you know, exactly what you're going to get. And, um, I, that to me, going back to sort of a range finder thing, it's almost there, there must be like a surprise almost <laughs> when, when you uncover a great shot. It is, it is, it is for sure. But it's, it's, it's. I'm kind of, I'm kind of in between, in between these worlds because uh, I never really. I, I tried only once to use, for example, the um, the Alexa with the with an optical viewfinder. Yeah. And I found it such a. I, I found it so weird, you know, because myself included, like I, I'm craving for for a nice electronic viewfinder. Yeah. Um, when I'm using red cameras, I, I just hate their <laughs> viewfinder. It's, it it doesn't that? look right. It doesn't look right. Like the contrast is off. It's not really the best way to to. And it's like because I'm operating, I have a really hard time 
if the image doesn't look right, uh, I have a hard time kind of separating and say like, okay, I should just judge composition. Hmm. Uh, if the contrast is off, in the, if the shadows are not right, it's like it throws me off so much. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm, I'm just like using a monitor with, with red cameras for, for some reason. Like, for example, like going to Panavision, the DXL has an amazing viewfinder, an amazing electronic viewfinder. Hmm. And the Alexa, they, they have a, a, a fairly decent viewfinder as well. So I, I, I get that and I understand that. But it's like a, the rangefinders have such an interesting, different experience that uh, they're, they are great. I mean, I, now going back to your question, I, I don't know. I have a, for example, lately, uh, I have a Hasselblad x pen. And I realized I didn't shoot that in like three weeks. And I'm like, oh, actually... I should go back to to that and just like if I'm just like shooting my kids all over the place and <laughs> it's such a great experience and um I don't know my Mia 7 that's that's a camera that I carry with me most of the time and uh, I got pretty heavily into into Leica <laughs> in the last 3 years yeah so I have a Leica MP and a, a monochrome I love that you that you have so much of a focus on photography I think it's something that a lot of the directors of photographies and cinematographers that come on the show don't necessarily talk too much about, um, you know, largely because they're promoting their film. Obviously, they want to talk about that. But it's great to have somebody with a passion for it that keeps consistently going back to it. And um, I love that. I think that's great. Of course, you also have your cinematography Instagram account. And I'll put that put them both on the show notes so you guys can <laughs> check out what you're doing. But let's talk about your film work, um, because, Wow. What a uh, what a, a reel that you have! <laughs> I love your commercial work. <laughs> I think you. it's fantastic. Um, I'm just sort of skimming through your site, and it's. I mean, you've got so many great titles on your on your resume. It's incredible, and of course, your work with Francis Ford Coppola. I'd love to talk about that because you were a filmmaker in Romania, and then all of a sudden, you're now working with Francis Ford Coppola. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure there were many steps in between, but that is an incredible. Uh, story and opportunity that came to you. And I'd love to hear about how that happened. It, it was, it's such a, an unbelievable story. Um, it, it's, it's funny. I think at that time I, uh, I've done only a um, bunch of shorts and, and two uh, features. And in all Romania, in Romania, and, right? Yeah. 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 They were all like Romanian productions and uh, there were like uh, two of the shorts were, were, Kind of part of the what it what it was called the Romanian new, new wave, and um, it, it was interesting. So, like we we started, but I would like we were so young, and I heard that uh, that Francis Coppola is coming to Romania, and like he wanted to to interview people, and then I I heard that he wanted to do uh, something that even I thought was like, oh, that's kind of strange, but it's interesting. Um, there were so many parts in the movie. Um, he had a hard time choosing all all the actors, and um, he, what he did was really interesting. He he took like I think three or four pages from the script, and he wanted to do a test um, ten days with different cast every day for the same four pages, and then he realized uh, he has to sh choose his cinematographer in the same time because he wanted a, a, a full Romanian crew, um, and. I remember meeting him and showing him the, uh, some of my short films, and uh, he invited me to be part of this test. And at the same time, I knew that a uh, bunch of other people were, like two of them were my teachers. They were like really experienced cinematographers oh, compared wow. to me. And I was 29 at that time. So in my mind was that there is no way I would get this job and I should just enjoy eight hours of, of shooting with Francis Coppola. So uh, had, having that mindset, I think um, I, I I just did what I knew best. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think he liked the inexperience and the youth and <laughs> the... <laughs> like craving for, for new equipment I had at that time. So uh, a month, like a month after I received an email from him saying like, okay, this is a script and this is how I usually like to work and uh, I would like to work with you. And I was like, oh my God, it's happening. Wow, you must have lost your mind. The movie we're talking about is Youth Without Youth, right? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> and this and, was your first of a few films with Francis Coppola. Yeah. 
Yeah, we 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 did youth without youth, and the the way Francis works now, it's it's really amazing because uh, he he finances his movies. So uh, in this way, he he can work with a really small crew and for a long time. Uh, he was in Romania for almost two years, um, and after we finished youth without youth, I was kind of finalizing, I think I was doing the DI for Youth Without Youth in LA when he told me like, oh, um, I have a new project. Uh, we're flying to Argentina in a few weeks. <laughs> and uh, uh, we went to Argentina to shoot Tetro. And there was another two years experience because we, we prepped pretty much for eight months. Wow. Um, because what it happened, it's it's like, uh, usually like when you, when, when you go with the, with a movie overseas, you just uh, you just go hire a production company and and uh, they will bring you the crew, you do a bunch of interviews, and you're ready to go. The way Francis did it in Romania and in Argentina too, uh, he really want. I mean, he brought me with him, um, but he really wanted a full Argentine crew. So mm. uh, we were the production company, meeting people and deciding like, okay, we 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 can. We can hire these guys and these guys, and we're just like kind of instead of taking a whole crew, we're kind of picking people <laughs> from from all these interviews and, wow. and redoing our crew based on our preferences. And in in eight months, when you're you're even if you're going to restaurants and just like you're continuously scouting and trying to figure out, you have the story in, in, in your mind when you're doing that. So it's really interesting compared to like a six weeks of prep when you're just going nonstop and really fast just to make sure you get everything right. Uh, when you have so much time and then you, you shoot for uh, a month or two and then you stop and you edit a little bit and then you shoot some more, like it's a, it's a really different process, but it's really interesting. And I think it everything... Uh, is more calm because the uh, the like his attitude on set was like oh I didn't get it today we can get it tomorrow and maybe even better <laughs> you know so it sounds like a good working uh, environment it is it is and it's very creative from that perspective because it's always like no matter how big or small the budget you you always be pressed uh, uh, of time and it's like. Uh, it's funny how there's never enough time, no matter how, how big the budget is. But um, I never felt that with Francis, just because the approach was 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 so different. And he's so good at like bringing, putting you in a in a spot. Where, like, let's try this crazy idea and let's try that. And like, how about that? But he's always, a, he, in the same time, he's he's a, he's a very good listener as well, and like he wants you to bring stuff back. And Youth Without Youth, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. The the images in it are really, really nice. And then you transition you. to uh, a black and white feature. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, two kind of black and white features in a row almost. And, um, you know, so, there are certainly differences between the, the two, but they are um, uh, Tetro, black and white entirely. And Twix, it's sort of a blend. There's some color in there. There's some sort of uh, supernatural looking environments there. And, and it's, I mean, talk about three completely different feels and looks back to back working with the same director. I mean, that must, <laughs> what, a, what a great beginning to, uh, you know, an incredible feature film career here in the States. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, uh, Francis is amazing because he's, uh, I think he, he's at that age where like he doesn't need to he doesn't have anything uh, to prove so yeah. he's just enjoying uh shooting movies uh, now and he's just like trying to experiment and trying to trying different things and it's just like it doesn't matter if uh, if you fail it's like just like you you tried something and the process itself is, is amazing it's talk really, to me about really shooting amazing. for black and white a little bit um it's it, it's interesting i i uh, uh, it took me a while and I was trying to figure out a, a few things. And then, um, especially that I, I, I had so much darkroom, black and white uh, experience, uh, in my mind was, uh, we'll, we'll just shoot black and white just to, to make sure. And um, at that time, there, was nev uh, there wasn't a monochrome digital camera available. But what I realized, there is a, there is a process 
uh, in Photoshop, for example, going back to still photography, where if you want a black and white image, the black and white sensor, it's a different thing. And like it can give you so much more uh, sensitivity and, and all that. And, yeah. and But what it's interesting about shooting a color sensor for black and white is that when you go in Photoshop, for example, you can choose your channels. And for example, if somebody has a red shirt, you can by just... Uh, adjusting the saturation of the of the red, you can make that shirt a darker or light, lighter gray, hmm. um, and that's kind of what I did as well because we we were monitoring black and white on set, but we we shot everything in color, and uh, of course uh, uh, shooting black and white it's it's such a a blast because uh, you can mix tungsten and and. HMI and color temperatures, you can go all over. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but what, and, and you would have to realize that the audience will be so much more focused on composition because they're lacking that, that color element there. So um, it has a lot of interesting, interesting things. But that's kind of what we did. We, we shot color for black and white. And in the DI, we were able to, to adjust on 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 certain channels, the 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 saturation basically translated into a darker or a lighter gray for certain colors. It's interesting that you say you the audience's focus is more on composition when colors removed, and and you know I think you're right. Uh, does that change the way that you shoot anything though? Do, or I mean, I'm you're always going to be framing things correctly. You're always going to be making things look the best that they can. But does it change the way you shoot? knowing that it's going to be black and white? I, I think it should, yeah. It, it, it did for me, for sure. There is there is a great book that I, I always bring it up. It's called um, Art and Visual Perception by Rudolf Arnheim. And um, what it's interesting, like he talks about uh, about the tools we are, we are using, uh, um, even if it's about still photography, painting, or, 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 or movies. And... The, the main thing that color does, for example, it's like if you want something to, to feel far away, uh, you'll use a, a, a colder color, like blue will feel that something is far away and mm. and uh, a warmer color will feel closer. So from that perspective, your your that tool is non-existent in a black and white image. So you have to work with shadow and lights, which kind of, they do the same thing. Uh, like shadow seems further away, light seems closer. Yeah. And it's like just alternating these shadow and, and light patterns, you will have a, a sense of depth. Where with color, the same if you alternate different colors, you'll kind of have the same same type of, of, of depth. So it's it's a tool that you don't have. And that's why I think you have to rely more on, on composition and, and light. Um, kind of uh, but not for every single shot, you know. It's like just having that uh, in your mind, and I think you you realize that it's like yes, framing and lighting becomes becomes really important. And texture, you know, the texture yeah, of yeah. the wardrobe and and the locations, and you're you're focusing on things. I think you're all as a, as a viewer, you're always focusing on those things anyway. But when it's black and white, you know, one of your not not really senses, but something's removed, so everything else is heightened in a way, and yeah, uh, yeah. and that's really important. <laughs> One of the things I love the most about doing this show is when you guys, our listeners, interact with us, and a lot of times, especially more more recently than ever before. People are re interacting with us and telling us about how they use Hedge, honestly. Like, they're sending us photos of them using Hedge on set. It's so cool. Now, for those of you that don't know, Hedge is a backup software for filmmakers. I use it all the time. I've posted photos of me using it. I'm using it right now. It's actually going on in the background as, as we speak. Um, now, I use it because it's a simple backup software. And it's faster than the Finder. It's super reliable. I can import multiple sources and send it to multiple destinations. So... I've got all my camera cards, I've got my audio cards, my behind the scenes photographers, everybody's giving me media and I'm able to import it all into Hedge and send it to uh, you know however many destinations that I choose. And usually I do two different hard drives. 
Now, I have the Hedge Connect app for my phone, so when the transfer is done, I get a little notification on my phone, and they're constantly updating the app, so I'm always getting the latest and greatest. Now, I strongly suggest you guys check out this software, but the first step is going to hedge.video forward slash go creative show. You're going to get a 20% off discount from the full license. You'll get access to the latest and greatest software that they have, and you can also check out the other applications they have, like Canister which is basically hedge for LTO. Uh, and there's so much to unpack there. So if you guys are LTO people, Canister is it for you. And if you don't know what LTO is, then it's not for you. <laughs> but everybody has files to back up, and that's why hedge is for everyone. So head over there, hedge.video forward slash go creative show, and check it out, you guys. I'm telling you, you will love it. You will love it. Let's talk about the hate you give. Uh, sure. A critical acclaim, fantastic film. Um, again, something completely different for from the <laughs> films that we've focused on here. And and honestly, I, I'm kind of seeing a trend with your work. When I look through your photography work, there's so many different styles. Like I can look through this <laughs> and I see I see like little little peeks into the other films that you've worked on. Uh, it's like this big culmination of little pieces of anything you're interested in, but also something that feels like the films that you've worked on. And, uh, you know, it's weird. It's like, I can't, I can't pinpoint a style with you, which I think is a really unique <laughs> and great, that that's a great thing for, for cinematographers and photographers for sure. Is there's just so much there and, uh, you know, all done very, very well. Tell me about the hate that, uh, the hate you give the look that you created for this, because there's really two looks in this film. Yeah, uh, it's it, it was interesting. Uh, actually, the first meeting I had with George, actually, actually the first the first time I met and George, George Tillman uh, Jr., the director. We're talking George about. Tillman, the director. Yes, uh, for for the for the interview. So the first time he told me, uh, yes, I have this idea. It's about this this girl and uh, her character lives in these two different worlds and he knew, knew from that from that moment he knew from the beginning that he wants to differ, differentiate between the the two worlds and uh, there was uh, something that uh, i remember remembered and uh, i kept thinking of it and when we started prep it became more and more clear uh, just visiting certain locations that we have to to figure out what would be what would be the best tools to do that. And what but, are the two worlds that we're creating, just to get people up to speed? Uh, uh, basically, the, the Garden Heights neighborhood and uh, the Williamson Private School, and uh, the whole story is about about Star's character that is called code switching from from her neighborhood to the private school, and. Uh, it's it's interesting. Like most of the the schools we we scouted, and definitely the one we chose, uh, not only that they they had like a giant glass facade that was reflecting the sky, and it was like a, they also had blue lockers. So there was there was so much blue and and uh, cold palette in in, in that that um, I I kind of liked everything I saw there and then when we when we saw certain houses for for the neighborhood they had this amazing uh, red and orange curtains they were filtering the sun so nicely oh. uh, I realized right away that's the way to go it's it's here it's real uh, the school the private school should be blue and uh, the neighborhood should be uh, should be warmer um, and uh, George liked that idea, and it was. It's like it's funny, like when you're when you're in prep and you go with the with the director and the production designer, and it's just like you see all these elements, and everybody's responding to them. That it feels right away, it's the right choice, and 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 then it was reflected in the wardrobe as well. So that was one of the main uh, elements we knew we wanted to go for, and also accentuated a little bit in the in the di process um but it was also it was funny because um we we were bounce, bouncing around from from spherical to anamorphic and and aspect ratios and it's a nice exercise like a lot of times you're you're trying to figure out what would be the best approach uh, in terms of aspect ratio what to for for your story and a lot of times it's 
um, it's interesting. It seems like an obvious choice, and then like you can go 180 degrees after that. And yeah, it, it felt for us at the beginning. It felt that 185 might be might be the right cho- choice to be like more. It feels it, it feels that 185 is more intimate as as an aspect ratio, where where widescreen 240 it feels more epic. But uh, that's only the first thing you think about like but we we end up doing the opposite we end up going for 240 and we end up shooting anamorphic for garden heights and spherical for for williamson and there was just an extra element uh for creating this difference between the two worlds but it was also it's funny it's like i i i like having um visual references from from other movies but uh i i tend to use more still photography <laughs> and, yeah uh, i'm not surprised I, re- I remember it was it was funny because i remember george uh told me it's like you know i cannot think of any other movie that would be a good visual references reference for us other than uh, which we did. There is a little bit of a, of a Spike Lee tribute in the opening of a movie, but that was kind of it. And even then, we were like, "What should be our visual reference?" And I remember um, I started printing a lot of a lot of stills, uh, and uh, because I love still photography so much, uh, everything I saw from from Eli Reed. Uh, which is an amazing still photographer. Uh, Eli Reed. Photog- Eli Reed is he's he's amazing. He's um, if I'm not mistaken, he's uh, he, he's uh, the first uh, uh, full time African American photographer employed by Mag Agent Agency. Really, um, he is amazing. Like his his stills are so so beautiful, and uh, it's exactly like that uh, that world of. Uh, of Bresson or of or Donon or like all the all the big Magnum guys. Um, yeah, I'm looking at remember, his stuff right now. I I remember printing those those stills and and I was looking with we were looking at them with with George and we we're trying to find. I remember we we came up with this idea that. Uh, George told me like there will be a lot of people that will be expecting a really gritty. Um, visual from from this movie and what if we surprise them what if we do something totally (laughs) different Uh, well something that i found very interesting is you're right i mean generally when we're um when we're showing like urban environments it's usually really really gritty and it has like a coldness to it in this film uh is Kind of the opposite. I mean, um, Star's neighborhood is the predominantly African-American community, and the way that you shoot that is it's warm. It's it's rich. It has a lot of warm tones, a lot of intimate photography. Um, contrast that to the, um, the prep school where things are blue and a little harsher and uh, colder. And I thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition. You're telling two stories. Um, and it, they have comp- two completely different feels to them. Yeah, yeah. And what I remember, what was really interesting was that we're looking at all these uh, Eli Reed photos uh, printed uh, on in my office, and uh, I, I think uh, talking to George, we realized like we both like contrast, we both like dark shadows. Yeah. But uh, and I remember the idea that came from from that meeting was we we need to be like an Eli Reed photo, but Printed on really high gloss paper, uh, so in my mind that was uh, definitely we have to go anamorphic <laughs> because mm-hmm. an anamorphic lens is it's kind of it can give you that and and uh, uh, compared to a, a spherical lens where things are not as 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 uh, as glossy even it's it's a certain like the the spherical will give you sharpness will give you uh, definition will give you all that but like it will lack that velvety glossy <laughs> uh it's, it's funny because it's, it's velvet and gloss in the same time yeah, yeah. it's a really interesting thing that anamorphic an anamorphic lens can can do um we also there was another interesting thing and it's like talking about visual references they can come from from anywhere it's like um, the least expected. We uh, we watched uh, uh, amazingly a Procter and Gamble commercial. 
Um, really? It's it's called The Talk, and it was shot in Anamorphy and uh, 240, and it's amazing. It's we we realized that was you know like sometimes you come up with the, with an idea but you 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 need a confirmation yeah and that was our, that was our confirmation that was like yes that that's exactly how our, our movie should look and uh, we are on the right track. I'm looking and, at the commercial right now. Okay, I can absolutely see I can see that inspiration. Yeah, yeah, it had the right the the, the right uh, vibe. The right like everything was was exactly how we we, we imagined we wanted to and it's just like from from like lighting with practicals and uh, while shooting anamorphic and it's like everything is there and it's like yeah they they did it and it's great and uh, we are on the right track <laughs> there were a couple really interesting visual techniques in this film i want to start with the party scene um because this was first of all the lighting was really cool everything it was it's almost like the mixture of the cold harshness of the school and the warmth of uh of star's neighborhood kind of clashed together into this reddish colorful but super sharp super harsh uh scene but you're also incorporating some um uh, some um slow motion effects in there too I, can you kind of walk us through that and how you came to that decision it's it's interesting it's like uh i remember george came with uh, with two um i think there were stills with two uh, visual references two stills from from a party and they looked very similar and you could see there was like for example a lamp that was covered in in like a red scarf and all that all that color saturation all that uh, vibrant color we we embraced and we thought it was exactly the right choice for the party where it's like it goes more towards a, a, a warm palette uh, but it's also so different than the neighborhood it was a really really uh, it was really great for us to to shoot that scene because it was so different visually than anything else we did in the movie and and we I'm glad we went for it because at one point we we thought about uh, it's like do we want everything to be that saturated um, would that look weird would it be like fake would it won't feel like a real party um, but then we realized like I think it, we thought it. it, it it has to be the right choice because there, there's no way you would have like like regular um, um, white light, you know, when everything is, is is blue and green and and predominantly red yeah. in that room. Uh, it should look like that, and we should go for it. And uh, I remember like the first uh, we we had a. a, a a pretty big pre-light there because the whole house had to be ready. We we knew we had two nights to to finalize that that whole scene, and and we we went for it and we didn't have any backup plan. But I'm glad we did, and I think it was it was great. Like we we used all this. Uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of LEDs, and uh, yeah, those were actually amazingly where. Most of them were um, hue lights, Philips hues. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was the right time. It, it, in the practicals, you say? I mean, yeah, yeah. That was all done with practicals and and some other LED tubes that were RGB. So, uh, but which, mainly, what tubes mainly, were they? Uh, the Asteras AX1. Yeah, I did a project with Asteras. I loved them. I yeah, loved them. They're they're great. They're amazing. And it's it's funny how uh, we we. Like everything, like still photography and and stage lighting, they're kind of intertwined now, and we we borrow things from, from one one from, from the other one. It's it's really interesting. I love that you use I, Philips Hue. It's like <laughs> anybody can just get those lenses. I mean, get those yeah. uh, lights. It's yeah, it's it's yeah. cool, but they they, they give really yeah. good color. They they are amazing. The saturation is great. The only problem they have, you have to shoot one seventy two point eight if you are twenty three nine eight, mm. because otherwise they will flicker. But other than that, they look great, and you can uh, you can do amazing things with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, th those are really cool, and um, I love the color saturation. and And I think using that as a technique to punctuate a certain scene is a good choice because it is a lot for an entire film. That that I think that would be too much. Definitely, yeah, yeah. I want to talk about another scene that uses some really interesting cameras. Um, the shooting scene with Khalil. Um, this is something where obviously you are 
depicting, uh, you know, newsworthy events. You're depicting something that is uh, super important. Everyone's talking about it. It's timely. You need to do this in a very sensitive way. Khalil is Star's friend, um, shot by a police officer. Uh, this is a scene that needs a lot of sensitivity. It needs a lot of kind of honesty. And I think you did a really interesting thing by having actual body cams and uh, actual dash, uh, dashboard cams be a storytelling agent for you, not just trying to mimic the look, but actually using them. I'd love to hear more about that. It's, it's, it's funny. I, I always tend to, um, I, I'm a firm believer that like, no, you can do, you can do everything. Like you can, you can, um, shoot with any camera and in post making look like you want it to, but there's nothing better than using the real thing. Yeah. Um, because you'll, you'll end up having li certain limitations and certain, uh, um, elements that no other device will give you. And I remember fighting for this pretty hard and it was tough on, on, on everybody. It was Who tough were you on, fighting? On... No, I mean, just trying to get one because it's not easy, uh, like to get a dashboard cam that it's working. Oh, okay. To get a body cam. It's just like trying to figure out how to do it and, uh, with, with, and to, to work with it. And it was tough on, on props. It was tough on my DIT, but then they all realized it's, it's so, um, different than a GoPro, for example. Like there are a few things it's like, uh, it has, uh, um, an infrared mode. Um, it has, uh, GPS coordinates burn, burnt into the image. It's so specific. You can, you can, kind of do like the bird in GPS, you can do that in post, but the infrared is so specific and the way it clicks on when it needs to, it's, it's, it's all, that's, that's the hardest to, 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 to simulate in post. But what it does that, unfortunately, the audience is so familiar with that type of image that there's no question about it. And I believe we, we used it only once in, in the whole scene, but it's so, real that uh, nobody would question it from a technical point of view it's it's it, it was insane because we we mounted on the car the dashboard for example the monitor is actually built into the rear view mirror and you need all sorts of things to be able to take the footage like a key a badge number it's it's a complicated process wow yeah but uh, but i'm so happy we did that because it's it's. I think it, it works so well for for the audience. There's like no question that's the real the real thing. Um, and for that scene, I remember uh, George telling me that it's in pretty much for for the whole movie. It's so much about about Star's character that we we came up with this rule uh, about camera movements, and the rule was that Star's emotions will dictate if we should be handheld or steady cam. Yeah, I, I read that. I read that about the film, and I, I'd love for you to elaborate on that a little bit more. What is what does that mean to you? Uh, it, it was it was great because a lot of times, like you can come up with all sorts of of things, and sometimes, like the worst you can do, you can choose to go handheld because everybody thinks it, uh, you're moving faster. You know, uh, I think it was it was a great thing that we we came with this rule really early on. And for example, what it did, uh, George knew that for 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 uh, Khalil's shooting scene, we wanted to be in the car and experience how how it is like from from uh, star's perspective and see everything from from her passenger seat and only when she goes out will go out with her and the only of course the only exception was a dashboard uh, uh, footage but um, things like that i think when you come up with a rule like this uh, things are becoming so much easier because uh, during a day on set you have to to take so many decisions and the the nice part of having rules is that you will know right away uh, how certain decisions <laughs> should should you you'll, you'll know how how it's so much easier to take those decisions you know and um, because everybody reads a script in a different way the only the only person on set who really have all the tools is the director and uh, sometimes you just want you just want to make sure that you tell his story and not yours, you yeah. know. And uh, <laughs> but having this rule helped us so much because there was never a question. We never argued, and it was just like 
I could see like between me and George, it's like, yeah, that should be handheld, right? And we were like, yeah, yeah that's exactly what, what we thought about, <laughs> you know. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Hot Shot by GYOM. Premium Beat is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. You get access to their collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks over there at premiumbeat.com for as low as $69 a track. Now, here's the thing. It's not just the individual track. You get cutdowns, you get loop sets, and now you get stems, which is huge. So you can like actually access the tracks within the song, the drum track, the bass track, however the stems are, uh, are separated for you. Now, what does that mean? It means complete customization to make sure that the song that you love fits your project perfectly. So it's all over there at premiumbeat.com. Check it out. Of course, you can get directly to this particular song, Hedge, uh, Hot Shot by GYOM, by going to our website. Uh, so there you go. Two different options to get all the music you want. And lastly, let's talk about Shutterstock.com. Shutterstock.com is where to go for your royalty-free video clips. They've got over 8 million of them, and a lot of them are in 4K, which is great. Um, I know a lot of you guys are certainly shooting in 4K, capturing in 4K, but more and more we're delivering in 4K too, so you want to have stock footage that uh, matches your output, obviously. And you're going to find great stuff over there too. Now, what I do is I go to Shutterstock, I go to Footage, and I click on um, their curated collections because when you go there, right? There's so many clips on Shutterstock, but when you go there, you get, as, as a good starting point, they kind of put together these really well curated collections of all different categories. And most of the time, um, what I'm looking for is kind of already in these lists of categories. And that's a great place to start because once you find a clip, you can find other clips that are similar to it. And you can just have a blast going down the rabbit hole and finding all sorts of goodies on Shutterstock.com. Now, of course they have music and they have images as well, but I mostly use it for footage. And uh, there's so much out there that is fantastic. So I strongly encourage you to check it out. Now, another thing that's new uh, is this Shutterstock Select section, which is their really high-end cinematic collection of footage. Now, this stuff is gorgeous. Yes, you pay a little bit more for it, but it is worth it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And that's also separated and curated into really great categories. So if you haven't checked out the Shutterstock Select section, oh, man, you got to check it out. If nothing else, it will, will inspire you uh, because the footage is beautiful. And that's what you want. That's what you want. You want variety and you want quality. And that's what you get at Shutterstock.com. So head over there, Shutterstock.com. So you shot on the Panavision DXL. Um, I also read that it was your first time using it. And I'd love to know kind of how you came to that decision. That's a pretty big risk to shoot a camera for the first time on a feature film. That's true. I mean, it was the first time on a feature, which it comes with uh, with all sorts of risks and crazy things. But I think that's the the beauty of our job because if we're if we're playing safe and use the same equipment, it's not it doesn't seem right for me. I don't know. How would you to come fair, to that decision? I, uh, to be fair, I tested that camera for like 10 days and I, I've shot two commercials on, on it before. Oh, okay. So, uh, it wasn't like it, it, it was, uh, really virgin ground. It was, we, um, it, it, it's funny. I always wanted to, to, to go for a bigger sensor digitally speaking. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. And it's like, I guess it's another still photography thing. Uh, it, the DXL has the same. It's it's what it used to be called the Vista Vision uh, size aperture, uh, size gate, uh, which is exactly what what a still photography camera that we call full frame is. Um, so, from that perspective, and knowing that the 50 will be your normal lens, and uh, looking at still photographies and you can relate to that depth of field and everything like it seemed the right choice and i was so happy when i heard the the, the that that panavision is doing that uh and it's essentially it's a red uh, monstrous sensor inside but the, what they do the color science was just breath breathtaking it's like their skin tones are, are so amazing so 
having that bigger sensor um, allowed us to do a few things. First of all, to use the the 1.3 D-squeeze anamorphic lenses, uh, which are called the Ultra Panavision 70s. And those were built, um, people are saying they were built for, um, in, 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 in the 50s, um, they were built for covering a 65 uh, millimeter, uh, uh, 65 millimeter uh, uh, film. So um, they will they will take the uh, the 2.0 aspect ratio and uh, squeeze it to a 270 aspect ratio. So uh, they can cover way more than a Vista Vision uh, um, format, but they are so interesting. Like everything is is like so so different than any other uh, modern anamorphic lens. Um, they come up with limitations because they are big and bulky and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. They they turn to be fairly fuzzy around the corners, and you have to be careful where you are placing your 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 actors so the lens can to make sure that the lens is resolving. But like, is it is it vignetting, you, or is it just like a little softness in the in glass? It's it's softness in glass, and it's it's kind of uh, the 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 down part of of anamorphic but like i think that's why the, the beauty of it it's, it's there too um a lot of times you will have the sharper you will be your center image and sometimes in a 240 composition if you have two people talking um and if you want to shoot wide open it might not resolve and uh, nobody might be in focus even if they are in focus yeah technically the lens might not resolve there so we kind of we kind of knew that uh, certain we should avoid shooting wide open on certain lenses, and uh, we unless it's just one uh, character in the frame and is dead center. So yeah. it's yeah. like yeah. It, it comes with all these. It's come. It's come. It comes with um, um, with all these restrictions. But I think it forces you into a certain uh, style that it's interesting. You know. And especially that we were um, so much focused uh, on, on Star's character and it, it, it was fine to have her in the center of the image most of the times. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. But uh, bottom line, what it does, having a larger format like VistaVision and using only 1.3D squeeze, when you go to spherical, it's not as drastic as, as shooting with a, with a Super 35 sensor. Uh, there is there is a difference, but it's not a giant difference as it is from from spherical to two times anamorphic. Is your commercial work testing ground often for camera and light choices? Kind of, kind of is. I mean, it's uh, at least I don't know if like when when I used it the first time, I felt it was it was right for that. It was a, an a, an NBA 2K commercial, and. Uh, it felt right. I, I did a bunch of tests with these lenses. I kind of like always wanted to to use these lenses, and that were, that felt the right uh, choice for for that commercial. Uh, and um, because you have so much more um, tools to play with in the commercial world, it's 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 can be a cons considered a testing ground. And you remember all those when you start a feature and it's like, oh yeah, I had that device that costs a fortune. <laughs> Maybe we can afford it for one day on a feature, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But um, it was it was great. I mean, it was, it's always tricky when you use brand new equipment and uh, it's like, but the beauty of a digital camera is there's like, you can, you can improve it. So if you give the right feedback, they can, come up with a new upgrade with a new firmware and uh, it can be solved. Um, we didn't have giant issues, but we, we, we kind of have a few, had a few power issues and, and things like that. And of course, uh, you need a really good crew. And uh, luckily I have my, my DIT Lyberg who, who, who jumps in everything, every crazy idea I have. He's trying to solve it. And uh, yeah, it sounds not... like it. You're like, I want real dash cams. I want real body cams. Make it, make <laughs> yeah. it happen. Yeah, pretty much. But he, he, I want to use big, big, heavy lenses. Well. Make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, I was really lucky with, with, with the crew in, in, in Atlanta as well. Like Eli has been working with me for like the last 
eight years. He's my main DIT. But uh, in, Atl- in Atlanta, like uh, uh, Max from Kara and, and, and Ryan, Boising, they were like amazing uh, uh, first ACs because a lot of times you throw them under the bus with all these lenses and all these crazy ideas and shooting <laughs> wide open and it's like, yeah, deal with it. And they're like, okay, let's see. And I mean, it's just like, but it's fun for them because if you're doing the same thing and just like use just like the same modern lens every day, like I, I could see it with them. I know it's so hard for them, but I could see them how, how, how happy they are that we're getting so amazing stuff and how, how, how happy they are. They can use this equipment. So well, the film is fantastic. It looks great, as does all of your other work, your photography work as well, which I'm right now particularly interested in because I've kind of been focusing a lot on photography lately myself. So I've been uh, I've been hey. focusing on that. Uh, but it's it's a really great film. You guys should absolutely see it if you haven't already. And thank you so much for being on the show and giving us some backstory about how you made these visuals a reality. It's it's always so interesting to hear. Uh, what's in the mind of the cinematographer and the choices that they make. So we're, uh, we're thankful that you, that you uh, came here and shared that information with us. Thanks for having me again. Where yeah. can people go to learn more about you and your work? Uh, I think, I mean, I'm still trying to, to update my website a little bit, but I think, uh, I think Instagram is a good, uh, a good place. Perfect. And we will put both of your Instagrams on our, on our show notes. So you guys can go and check them out and follow them and, and share all of his great posts. Thank you so much for being Thank on you. the show. I really appreciate it. And we'll have to have you back for your next big film. Definitely. I'd love to. A big thank you to Mihai Malimari Jr. For the great discussion. The great chit chat. His movies are great. You guys got to check it out. If you haven't seen his films, go see them. Go see them. They're beautiful. I also want to thank Matt Russell. He's beautiful, too. He's a beautiful man. Uh, He mixes and masters and makes this show sound so good. And you can hire him for your own project. There's a lot of mix to picks people. A lot. And uh, he's fantastic. You can find him at GainStructure.com. GainStructure.com. And on Twitter, at GainStructure. And while you're on Twitter, you can tweet us. At Go Creative Show. Let us know what you think of the show. If you have any suggestions for guests, we take that stuff very seriously. I also want to thank our sponsors. Hedge.video, Rule Boston Camera, News Shooter, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. That would stink. We've done 161 of these right now. It'd be so sad if it ended now. So support those that support us, and we'll keep cranking them out for you. See you next week. <laughs>